Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and our Salerno series, where there are today is just two more shows, both coming your way tomorrow. One about medics or the Royal Army Medical, Royal Army Medical Corps on the beach, and one later on with Dr. Alexander Clark about the naval aspect. But right now, we're back to infantry again. Our guest today is Jeff Hunt. He's a director of the Texas Military Forces Museum, who has recently returned for Battlefield Tour to Italy. So it's all fresh in his mind, and he's here to talk, of course, about the 36th Texas Division. So I'll bring him in. Good afternoon, Jeff. How are you today? Good. Good afternoon. I mean, it's it's lovely when I've got a guest who's literally just come back from the <laughs> battlefield he's talking about because, you know, that understanding of terrain, it's it's absolutely fresh in your mind. Yeah, it, it was my first trip uh, to Italy, and there there is never a substitute for standing on the ground and seeing it from, uh, from the GI's point of view. Uh, a lot of things that seem kind of uh, cloudy in, in the official histories and the memoirs become very clear to you uh, when you're uh, in the in the in the space, so to speak. Absolutely. And and tell us a little bit about the museum and and, and how long you've been there and what what its focus is. Yeah, well, I've been here since the end of '07. Uh, before that, I spent 11 years as the uh, chief curator, and director of the Living History Program at the Admiral Nimitz National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas, which is the hometown of Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz the commander in chief of the Pacific theater during World War II, uh, which is about an hour and 15 minutes uh, west of where I am now. Camp Mabry is the headquarters of the Texas Army and Air National Guard, as well as the Texas State Guard and the 36th Infantry Division. It's right here in the middle of Austin, Texas. Of course, it was established in 1892. It was well outside the city. Mm -hmm. The city's uh, grown up around it. Uh, but our museum, uh, which was uh, founded in 1992, uh, is in a World War I era mess hall that uh, was constructed in 1918. It's a 45,000 square foot building with a 26,000 square foot exhibit, several acres of outdoor uh, exhibits, uh, aircraft, artillery pieces, tanks, armored personnel carriers, uh, jets, helicopters, you know, that sort of thing. We are the official museum of the Texas National Guard uh, and so also the official museum of the 36th Infantry Division. Brilliant stuff. Well, you've come armed with a very extensive PowerPoint that you're in charge of. Folks, we'll do questions as we go along. And, you know, where there'll be some kind of recurring themes of the things we talked about with Matthew Graham and, and the 45th Infantry Division shows we did last week. But basically, I'm going to hand over to Jeff uh, to take us through the 36th Division at Salerno. All right. Well, uh, happy to talk about this very interesting subject. You know, Salerno uh, as an invasion is something that I think in a lot of people's minds, is kind of a vague thing. Uh, you know, the paradigm of amphibious uh, assaults in the European theater uh, for many people is overlord, uh, which of course is a, a very unique kind of operation, both from the German defensive uh, side of things and the allied offensive uh, side of things. Everything that happens in the Mediterranean uh, is a, a little bit more, uh, well, it's a lot more fluid. Uh, and uh, the preponderance of Allied power is not as overwhelming in the Mediterranean in 1942 and 1943 as it's going to be on the, uh, the coast of Normandy uh, in mid-1944. Uh, uh, so uh, if you're, you're looking for a repeat of Omaha Beach anywhere in the Mediterranean, you're, you're going to be disappointed. If you're looking for the kind of German defenses that we run into in Normandy, you're, you're not going to find them. Uh, and in that sense, the, the battlefield is a much more even uh, battlefield. Uh, the Germans, in fact, still have some air power uh, to play with in the Mediterranean, especially when you're talking about Salerno uh, and Anzio. Uh, and uh, just sort of to remind ourselves, you know, where, where uh, Salerno is and what's going on. So after the fall of Sicily, uh, the Allies very quickly decided to, uh, and, and I do mean very quickly, in both the strategic sense, they, they were sort of making these decisions on the fly, uh, practically speaking, uh, to try and take advantage of the fall of Sicily and what that had done to Mussolini's government uh, to invade Italy. So the Eighth Army, you know, crosses there into the toe and starts to advance north. Uh, the Germans don't resist uh, the Eighth Army's advance, uh, not in terms of combat troops, but they do resist it with a great deal of demolition. Uh, they're blowing bridges and culverts and wrecking roads and the, the kind of thing that the Germans uh, are, are expert at. And so uh, the Eighth Army doesn't suffer a lot of casualties, but it moves very slowly. Uh, and with the Eighth Army going up the boot, there was a real question amongst the Germans 
about whether they would fight to defend Italy or not, which of course was a big question for the Allies too. Will the Germans fight uh, to defend Italy? And there was a division of opinion uh, with Rommel, uh, who is in command of the Italian troops in northern Italy, uh, believing that you should abandon the peninsula, pull back basically to the southern slope of the Alps, which would be easily defended, uh, and and not uh, throw a lot of manpower, a lot of resources into the Italian theater. Uh, that was Hitler's uh, and the German high command's predisposition as well. Uh, but Field Marshal Albert Kesserling, who'd been running the war in the Mediterranean uh, for the Germans and the, uh, and the Italians while they were still allies for a long time, who had orchestrated a, a rather successful German effort in Sicily, uh, believed that Italy, uh, especially south of Rome, was ideal defensive terrain. Uh, and that you could make the Allies bleed a great deal uh, for it. Uh, and uh, he would eventually uh, win out, especially Hitler's mindset of, you know, don't yield ground, no retreat, uh, that sort of thing, uh, uh, found favor with what uh, Kesseling is doing. Uh, so uh, you, you've got this big strategic ambiguity after Sicily. Yep. And the, uh, the Germans are aware that the Italians are trying to surrender and the Italians are trying to make a deal with the Allies. Uh, the Italians, of course, don't want to surrender unless the Allies are going to sweep in and sort of protect them from the Germans. Uh, and so the decision to launch an amphibious assault against uh, the boot of Italy uh, is made, again, uh, on the fly, uh, without any real strategic thought behind it. Uh, you know, how far would we go? What would we attempt to do? Would we, would we just grab Naples, uh, get the airfields around Foglia to support the strategic bombing offensive into into Southern uh, Europe and, and kind of stop there? Would we go on and push toward Rome? Of course, if the Rush, uh, if the uh, uh, if you're trying to keep the Russian front in mind, uh, the idea that after Sicily, we wouldn't do anything with our infantry in Europe was unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, the Russians are facing the bulk of the German army, 165 divisions on the Eastern front. And uh, although you're not yet ready for overlord, the Americans want overlord now. If the British aren't ready and the landing craft aren't there. So it, it, the British are going to win that argument. Uh, but, you know, Churchill and, and Roosevelt both agree, well, we have to do something for the Russians. Uh, and Italy is the only place where we can really fight the German army. Uh, and that's better than nothing. And perhaps the Germans will abandon southern Italy, will get Rome very easily. And this this will look really good. It'll knock the Italians out of the war. I think there was some hope that the Italian army would flip sides and be worth something to the Allies. Of course, that, that is a uh, uh, that's not really going to to pan out. Uh, but that said, uh, the decision was was made, and uh, the Allied uh, commanders and and the two principal ones here are going to be Mark Clark, uh, Lieutenant General, who's commanding the Fifth Army, and Admiral Kent Hewitt is going to command the Allied naval forces there. Uh, they get forty five days to plan this invasion. You, you, you ponder how long we took to plan the operations of the Pacific, how long we took to plan uh, Normandy, even uh, Southern France got a lot yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 40, 40 days, that, that's that's one month and a half, uh, essentially, is, is all you get. Uh, and uh, the other thing, of course, with the uh, operation is that you, you wanted to pick a, a point as far north as you could go. And they really did think for a while about dropping parachute, uh, parachute troops on Rome, uh, invading close to Rome. But all of that was outside Allied air cover. So the Gulf of Salerno, which is sort of at the limit of Allied airplanes flying out of Sicily, is what gets selected. Uh, and uh, it, it's a perfect landing place in terms of uh, terrain and, and uh, hydrography and that and the beaches and, and that sort of thing. The, the sea there is relatively calm most of the time, uh, but it would be a very broad invasion front. And uh, Clark wanted to go in with four divisions, but there was only shipping a landing craft to go in with three. Uh, and of course, that, that will happen to him again at Anzio. He wants to go in with three and there's only enough shipping to go in with two. Uh, so this is a sort of a, a shoestring kind of operation, uh, hoping for the best uh, from the beginning. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a tougher job than you might have otherwise had. If they'd gone in with four divisions, landed uh, you know, on the first day, uh, things would have turned out very differently uh, than going in with three and then having another one come ashore uh, in the days afterward. Uh, this is going to be the initial combat operation for the 36th Infantry Division, uh, which is a Texas National Guard division. Uh, 
Uh, 36 was created in 1917 uh, uh, when America entered the First World War, initially made up of units from Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, thus, the symbolism of its shoulder patch of blue arrowhead representing Oklahoma, which before it became a state, had been the Indian Territory, with a T for Texas superimposed on top of it. Uh, 36 saw 24 days of combat on the Western Front uh, and uh, as the Texas and Oklahoma unit. And then when it came home and was demobilized, uh, it, it became an all-Texas Guard unit. It was an all-Texas Guard unit uh, when it was called into federal service in November of 1940. Uh, and in September of 1941, uh, its Texas Guard commander, uh, General Claude Burkhead, who'd done a fairly decent job training the division, is certainly a dedicated guardsman who kind of helped keep things going in that very bleak interwar uh, period when money and, and supplies and everything else was uh, was hard to come by. Uh, he had he was too old uh, and he really wasn't meeting the expectations of high command, so they flopped him out uh, in the middle of Louisiana's uh, maneuvers with Major General Fred Walker. He was a professional soldier, World War I hero, uh, had commanded a battalion in the Battle of the, the, uh, the Second Battle of the Marne uh, in 1918, won a Distinguished Service Cross uh, there. Uh, his machine gun battalion helped to repel uh, an attack by 10,000 German troops across the Marne River. So he, he was an experienced soldier, not a West Pointer. Uh, he joined the Guard and uh, then gone into the regular Army, but had gone to all the staff and war colleges. In fact, he had been one of Mark Clark's instructors, uh, and he would be one of the older men to command an American Infantry Division in combat in World War II. And interestingly, he would command the same division longer than any man uh, would command an American division over the span of World War II. He would have the 36 from September of 41 until July of 44. Mm. Uh, which is a long time, uh, and he was in—he uh, was 56 years old, uh, and that was that was far older than uh, George Marshall really thought his division commanders uh, should be. Uh, but uh, he was an exceptionally good trainer of men. He was a, a good combat soldier, a good combat leader. His troops became very devoted to him. Uh, and after the war, uh, when he left the 36th, he would take command of the infantry school at Fort Benning. He would retire from the Army uh, in 1946 and become the Adjutant General of the Texas National Guard uh, immediately uh, afterwards. Uh, his uh, command uh, consists of uh, a triangular infantry division, uh, so everything's coming in threes. Uh, so the 141st, 142nd, 143rd uh, Infantry Regimental Combat Teams, the 111th Engineer Battalion, 111th Medical Battalion. He's got four artillery battalions, three light slash medium, the 131, 132, 133. He's got a heavy uh, artillery battalion, the 155th, uh, the 60, uh, 636 Tank Destroyer Battalion uh, is uh, the integral tank destroyer battalion. And then, of course, there are all kinds of other, you know, headquarters units, uh, you know, yeah. medical uh, and clearing and MPs and reconnaissance and, and that sort of thing. Uh, a infantry division for the American Army at this point in the war is 14,000 men, but he's heavily reinforced at Salerno by additional tank and anti-tank destroyers and a regiment of engineers. And that. So he's going to have 23,000 troops at his disposal uh, for the landing. Uh, some of them will be from the 45th Division and will be temporarily under his command until the 45th Infantry comes ashore and then they'll, they'll revert back over. Uh, 36... Um, had spent a lot of time in training. Uh, when it started off, it was all a Texas Guard unit. Uh, but uh, as with a lot of American divisions that are in training in 1941 and 1942, uh, they they constantly get raided of their best personnel that are being shipped over right, to fill yeah. out divisions that are going overseas first. And so Walker has to kind of rebuild this division three times uh, before it, it gets overseas to North Africa. Um, it was initially slated to go into Sicily, uh, and it was decided that uh, you shouldn't, uh, Sicily would be heavily defended at the beaches, and you shouldn't throw a raw National Guard division into that mess. So we'll, we'll send uh, the 1st Infantry Division instead, which is ironic because then, you know, uh, Sicily is really not a contested beach to speak of, and yep, Italy yeah, yeah. will be. Uh, so this will be the 36th Division's baptism of fire. Uh, and any unit going under fire for the first time, of course, is is going to have unexpected uh, problems. Uh, men are going to have to get accustomed to being shot at, to, to killing other men. 
They have to learn the tricks of their enemy. Some commanders are going to measure up. Some NCOs and enlisted men are going to measure up and others aren't. And you don't you can't know any of that uh, until you're actually uh, under fire. But it's interesting you say that, Jeff, because that's, you know, when we had Brad on talking about the Canadian division, you know, the, that impossible to answer question about whether or not a fresh, well-trained division is better or worse. And how do you measure better or worse? What metrics do you use than one of the battle hardened divisions that is dealing with replacements, replacements dealing with fatigue? I mean, it's these are these are the imponderable questions like in sport, you know, whether whether you bring the, the veteran quarterback on or you or you you blood the, the, the new player, the, 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 or, or in soccer terms, football terms, the same thing. I, you know, I know you're incredibly loyal to the 36 Texas because of your 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 job, but they are in a very good order they've had a lot of solid training before going in there so when some books refer to them as green yes they are but but again it's balancing it with a veteran unit that is tired uh, how, how do you kind of uh, assess the, the different types of division that are going I, in? I think the division was as well trained as the division could be uh yeah. to, to go into battle almost all of its leaders are going to measure up uh it's going to as we'll talk about in a minute display a great deal of grit uh, and, and gallantry in its first action. It's going to learn its lessons very quickly. Um, uh, and you compare a green division to a, uh, a, a combat hardened division. And as the American Army figured out uh, under the studies done by SLA Marshall yep. uh, during and after World War II, uh, that after about 145 days in combat, a man or a unit is going to begin to lose its edge. It's going to hit an apogee, and then it's going to begin to slide down. Uh, you're, you're going to be far more aggressive. You're going to be more willing to take chances. You're going to bounce back from things quicker. Or early on, you're going to get your feet under yourself. Eventually, you're going to begin to feel like a professional. I, I got this. And then you're going to start to notice how many men are not there with you who were there with you at the beginning. And the replacements are going to come in. They haven't learned those lessons. They haven't been hardened. There's going to be a general falling off and, and degradation. Uh, so you can have a unit that was outstanding at one point, and it gets shot to pieces, and it's it's got to get rebuilt. It's not going to be outstanding uh, when it goes in the first time before uh, there's a certain advantage to fresh uh, green troops uh, during the Mexican War. Uh, General Zachary Taylor at the Battle Point of Vista uh, commented afterwards that, you know, he, he really lost that battle uh, to the Mexicans, but his green volunteers didn't know they had been beaten. And so they didn't run away. <laughs> they stood and fought. Uh, and so there's something to be said sometimes for for men who have not become savvy enough to realize that, oh, my gosh, tactically, this is hopeless. We should save our skins and live to fight another day. Instead, they're going to stand there and they're, they're going to be stubborn, uh, which is not to say that the, the 36 is going to have problems at Salerno. In fact, all the units that that, that fight in Italy are going to have uh, those problems just because of the, the nature of their enemy who was battle hardened uh, and uh, at least leavened with a lot of battle hardened uh, leaders and NCOs uh, and uh, and the terrain and, and these sorts of things. But this this was a good division. Uh, and uh, all loyalty to the 36 aside, uh, it, it, I think, does better uh, at Salerno than the 45th Division does. Uh, that's not necessarily the 45th Division's fault, uh, they, where they were put in the line uh, and, and what they were being asked to do was probably not something that, that could be done. Uh, yeah. And so circumstances are always part of how well uh, a unit does. It's always good to, to have victory be your first experience on the battlefield, though. Yeah, yeah, I concur. Yeah, yeah. Any brilliant stuff so far. We're loving it. So, um, Clark gets 45 days to plan this operation. That's not a lot of time. Of course, that cascades downhill uh, to all the divisions. Uh, and much to uh, General Walker's frustration, uh, his very carefully crafted combat loading plans and preparations for what troops are going into what ships uh, constantly are getting changed as ships are added or subtracted from the invasion force. Uh, and he, uh, as he's trying to uh, load out, uh, Corps and Army are constantly saying, oh, this ship has to carry bombs for the Air Force, or we have to put vehicles here for, for Corps headquarters and that kind of thing. So the, the careful combat loading really gets disheveled. Uh, and it's very frustrating for Walker. So it's not as clean as he might otherwise have been. 
the, the rigorous rules that were imposed on the overlord operation where, you know, you've gone down to, you know, where the individual guy carrying what weapon stands in the LCVP uh, are, are not in existence here. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of problem with the preparation and the loading is not done to the standard that Walker would have wanted or that it ideally should have been, but it does get done uh, and, and it gets done remarkably quickly. Uh, and the allies uh, set sail uh, for their invasion beaches. And, and this is a map of uh, the invasion beaches here. Uh, and as you'll see, the British are going to be landing to the north uh, up in here. Uh, the commandos and the rangers are going to go onto the right flank to seize the high ground from which the invasion could be fired on from the flank. And also across these hills, then is Naples, which is the uh, the primary objective of the invasion. Then the 36 is going to land down here uh, near the ancient ruins of Pestum. But look at this big gap. It's 10 miles wide. Uh, between the invasion beaches. And, and in Normandy, one of the reasons you got Omaha is, you know, you wanted to land at Omaha, you knew where you wanted to land in the British zone, you had to have a landing place in the middle. Uh, and, and so you had to pick, and, and, and Omaha is what got picked. Uh, but uh, this is uh, something of a, a challenging uh, zone uh, because here's an aerial photograph of the center of the 36th Division's landing area. And so if you look here, you got a little creek uh, and the 141st Regiment is gonna land two battalions here uh, on uh, yellow and blue beaches. And you're gonna land two battalions the 142nd here uh, on red and green beaches. Uh, right here, this, these are the ancient temples of Pestum. Uh, it was a Greek colony founded in Italy between 450 and 550 BC taken over by the Romans in 237 AD. And of course, it's long since been abandoned, raided for its marble and most of its building materials and stuff, but it's a, a majestic uh, archeological site. Uh, right down here, just inland from this creek is a 16th century watchtower uh, that the Germans will have a machine gun in. And then you've got Mount Soprano uh, looming over all of this. And then over here, high ground around the village uh, of, um, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, Alta Vila uh, and uh, and above that hill uh, 424 uh, and so uh, you know again Pestum there in kind of the middle and there where you see those trees close to that creek that's where uh, the watchtower is and Soprano is the big height there uh, in the in the very back um, and it, it uh, is just, magnificent. Just to jump in, they they didn't have anything like the the stock of aerial photos they have for overlord a year later this is the you know the, yeah, the no, maps were not as good the intelligence wasn't as good they you know we, we that came up in the 45th show is that they, they're not going in there blind but they're not going in with, not the, going with in the there blind. Uh, they they did have strip maps that were issued to the division that had the topography and some of the enemy defensive uh, installations and that kind of thing so not blindfolded but not 2020 vision i yeah. guess i should say I mean, it's improved uh, a bit. I mean, we can see that arc of improvement. I mean, I remember we were talking about the Casablanca landings in Torch, where they didn't even know uh, the, the tank battalions there about the coral and the reefs and things like that. So, you know, from the early days of knowing almost nothing about where we land, I'm thinking back to the dark days of the commando raids in 1940 and 41, where we just right. sent them in with, with no information at all. And then by 44, you have this massive amount of resources. You can see the arc of improvement, but this is in that period where you, you, it's not... It's not the finished package yet. It's not the finished package. And as Rick Atkinson says in, in his great book, Day of Battle, uh, th there were things that had been learned from North Africa and Sicily and things that had been forgotten <laughs> uh, from North Africa and Sicily. Uh, and so as personnel change, as units change, uh, the learning process is, is kind of ongoing. Uh, and so uh, one of the interesting things uh, about uh uh, where the 36 is going to land, of course, is that it's got some really distinctive landmarks uh, to help it out. And, and one of these are the ancient ruins of Pestum here. Uh, and these pictures are of some of its uh, biggest temples. There are great uh, pictures from during the campaign that show GIs amongst these. Uh, there's a picture in this spot here where you've got a battalion headquarters that's set up in a row of men working switchboards and typewriters and ambulances parked around these things. 
Uh, so you, you did have some landmarks there, including a railroad and a canal uh, that would uh, were the points designated by uh, General Walker uh, for, uh, for forming the stop line. This is where we'll yeah. organize after getting ashore. Of course, one of the things that nobody uh, had really anticipated in laying the plan uh, is that the Italians were going to surrender. Uh, and uh, they, they finally capitulated on uh, the evening of September 8th. Uh, and that news was announced to the troops right before they went ashore. Now, this is a picture of 36th Division troops cheering the announcement of the Italian surrender. Uh, and that really did kind of take an edge off the division. Uh, because, you know, a lot of guys now thought, well, there won't be much resistance, uh, you know, and, and this will be easy. In some, some men said it was a letdown. We were, we were all, you know, girded to go in there and have a big fight. And instead, this is going to be another training uh, operation. Uh, and the officers were going around trying to tell these guys, well, yeah, the Italians have surrendered, but the Germans haven't, and they're going to be there and waiting for you. Uh, Walker, of course, uh, wasn't surprised. He knew that there was a German armored division. Uh, waiting for him uh, behind the beaches of Salerno. It was just a question of how much resistance it could put forward. Uh, but the disappearance of the Italians uh, is is going to uh, matter uh, because uh, when you go ashore, uh, the Germans are going to have to have taken up the position of all that Italian infantry. Uh, so this is uh, where the Americans were intending to uh, land. Uh, uh, on uh, the beaches of Pestum. So you can see the 141st, uh, two battalions uh, to the right, uh, the 142nd, two battalions too. But you look at this and you see inland, uh, where right in the center is the Tower of Pestum. Uh, and then you've got the ruins of Pestum and you've got this railroad line and stuff like that. Uh, so the planning here is pretty good. I mean, here's where the troops are going to assemble. Here's where we're going to park the vehicles. Here's where we're going to put the fuel and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, so this is certainly not a slick shod kind of operation uh, on, on the part of uh, the 36. Um, what are they going to go on to? Well, this is Yellow Beach. So this is the left flank of the 141st that's standing basically at the water's edge looking inland. So you can see that there's not really high ground there. It's all very flat. Uh, you've got a slight sand dune with some underbrush. The sand is, is fairly loose. So you're going to need steel matting uh, to move very heavy vehicles across it. Uh, and this is what the uh, German infantry is going to see. So from defensive positions, you see they can't quite see the beach uh, and fire onto that with machine guns and things because of these dunes. Um, and uh, some of their positions are, are ancient. So this is a 16th century defense that is being used by the Germans. Uh, and they had dug it out here, you can see, to, to put an anti-aircraft gun uh, in there. And then they would sandbag it up. It's got some underground caverns where they could cower uh, from an artillery bombardment. Uh, but there's not going to be an artillery bombardment uh, because Fred Walker uh, decides that uh, it would not be helpful to fire naval artillery into his invasion zone. The British are going to have an, inva an pre-invasion bombardment off to the left flank. But when Walker looks at this, he, he can't see any targets that really justify uh, destroying potentially the temples at Pestum, uh, destroying a lot of Italian homes, killing a lot of Italian civilians. The Germans don't really have any fixed defenses here. And in fact, uh, Walker says, you know, what we ran into is some rusty barbed wire and landmines. Uh, and scattered detachments of German infantry with machine guns and then artillery fire and that kind of thing. So nothing that really justified uh, using the massive preponderance of naval firepower that was available to him. Uh, by the way, this is something for which the Italians who live in this area are still immensely grateful to Fred Walker for. He's a little bit of a hero to them uh, because he mm. could have simply blown all of this, uh, this uh, ancient uh, archaeological wonder apart. Uh, and he decided not to not to do that. Uh, and so he's held in, in very high esteem by them. But uh, that didn't mean that, you know, these these places are not used by uh, the Germans. Uh, and so you can sort of see uh, right there on the edge, there's some people standing there on the beach. So when you initially come ashore, uh, you're not going to you're not going to be seen unless, of course, you've got some height. And this is a 16th century watchtower right in the middle of the Allied invasion beach. Uh, in which the uh, the uh, Germans will have a machine gun that will give the the Americans 
uh, some fits. Uh, but the uh, the landing itself is going to go fairly smoothly. You've got uh, LCVPs that are going to go to the edge, to the center of each uh, beach. They're going to flash the appropriate colored light uh, back toward the sea so that the incoming wave of landing craft know one battalion goes left, one battalion uh, goes right. Uh, you're a long way from shore, though, because the Germans had naval mines uh, off the coast. The minesweepers had to come in and clear that. So you're, you're anchoring like eight to 10 miles offshore. Uh, so that's a long ride in uh, for the landing craft. And so the troops went into the landing craft, the initial waves at midnight, but they're not going to go ashore until 3.30 uh, in the morning. And uh, that meant there was a fair amount of seasickness. Uh, not that the, the ocean was rough, but that long in a small boat breathing diesel fumes uh, is yeah, not, not going to do anybody any favors, right? Uh, so uh, waiting for them on shore, of course, uh, there were Germans. The 16th Panzer Division uh, is there, uh, and there are a lot more German units that will be coming in toward the invasion, but the commander of the 16th didn't have enough troops to, to do anything like form a solid front. So he had divided his units into four defensive pockets, if you will, uh, and scattered infantry and anti-tank guns and mortars and artillery to uh, harass uh, the Americans as they came ashore, try and slow them down, bleed them a little bit. But there was no possibility of him concentrating forces and making a great big dash to try and drive the Allies into the sea here. Uh, that just wasn't really in his cards. Uh, that doesn't mean that this isn't tough. The First two waves get ashore without too much difficulty, but by the time the third waves are coming ashore, the Germans are fully awake. The mortars are coming in, uh, the machine guns, all this sort of stuff. Of course, they're firing from high ground onto pre-designated targets. Uh, this is the official uh, painting of the division's landing at Salerno. The, it's a little bit skewed because the, this, from this perspective, the, the author... Uh, is trying to get the high ground of Soprano in there to kind of make the point. Uh, but these guys actually should be running right toward that high ground, not veering off to the, the side of it. But uh, the artillery fire did mess up the landing quite a bit. Uh, some boats uh, with uh, green coxswains turned back and had to be turned around and, and so that uh, it delayed getting the artillery and the tanks ashore and the follow-up waves. It completely disrupted the very intricate landing plan so it added to the natural chaos that you were going to have, uh, it, you know, even if everything had worked uh, exactly perfectly. And, and Jeff, was there, you know, we, you talked about the decision about to not have a naval bombardment. And uh, we had one of our viewers is saying it was also involved. The, the Sixth Corps commander, Ernest Dawley, was involved in that decision as well. But um, was there any ability to kind of call upon the Navy if you ran into problems? I mean, that you know, we know later in the war, the forward observers become a key thing. They hadn't planned to use it, but have they got it in their pocket, or is it? Oh yeah, they absolutely have it uh, in their pocket. Uh, and so, naval observers are going forward with the radios in the first waves. The problem is that almost all the radios get wet. Yeah, and they won't work. And so, it's they not until nine thirty yeah. that you can call in the first of the naval fire. Uh, so, and that will be extremely helpful in the second half of the day. But in the initial landings. Um, it, it was not available uh, to you at, at all. Uh, General Walker uh, is, uh, is going to come ashore fairly quickly. This is, is, is a really great combat photograph. So you see there in sort of the right foreground of the picture, that's the Tower of Pestum. Uh, yeah. And then in, you can sort of see the shells bursting, the landing craft, uh, you know, in relief against that and, and how quickly the, the ground rises. But it was mostly mortar and artillery fire uh, that was contesting the movement of the landing craft, the unloading of vehicles and, and things like that on, on the beach. Uh, by the time that Walker comes ashore, and this is him and his landing craft uh, heading toward the beach, uh, things are decently in hand. Uh, the Americans are running into pockets of German resistance. Uh, and, of course, green troops pinned down by machine guns, that sort of thing. I have to figure out how to deal with that problem. Uh, the 16th Panzer is also going to start to uh, move in uh, with uh, penny packets of tanks. Five tanks here, eight tanks there, 13 tanks there. All, all of them Mark IVs, uh, Mark IV Specials uh, with the long 75s. 
Uh, but they generally attack without infantry support because the infantry has been scattered about to form these little pockets of resistance. Uh, and of course, tanks moving forward without infantry uh, are operating at a pretty serious disadvantage. Uh, over on the American right flank, where the terrain was a lot flatter, uh, the German tanks actually got down onto the beach and they cut off a battalion of the 141st and kind of kept it isolated for most of the rest of the day. Uh, every place else, uh, the German tanks going to have a really rough time. Uh, the naval gunfire support in late afternoon is, is going to aid to that. Uh, but just enough artillery got ashore just quick enough uh, to, to help deal with that. Uh, American tank destroyers um, and uh, half-track mounted 75s, that sort of thing. Uh, if you read the after-action reports, though, of all this fighting, you, you note that mines were a problem. Uh, on the beach. This is General Walker's command jeep that got blown apart uh, by a mine. Uh, and the artillery uh, coming in, the Germans actually managed to launch some airstrikes, which of course was terrifying business for the men, you know, the engineers and, and uh, whatnot trying to, to come ashore. Uh, none of that was, was very uh, easy to deal with because it was your first time uh, yeah. under fire. Uh, but the combat uh, that is happening, if you read these AARs, is almost unbelievable. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you that uh, if the things that were written up in the, the official, you know, uh, after action reports very quickly after the action was over, if you put those in a movie, uh, I, I would probably be inclined to call BS. Uh, you know, a soldier runs up and fires his, his uh, Thompson submachine gun into the view slit of a Mark IV. Uh, and, and kills the crew. Guys jumping up on tanks and, and opening their hatches and dropping grenades down into them. You know, bazooka men uh, knocking out tanks, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it really, uh, it's remarkable that, that American infantry, especially green infantry in combat for the first time, uh, showed that kind of valor and, yeah. and determination. Uh, they also learned very quickly, what, they found out that one of the German tricks was to just open fire with rifles at a sector. Uh, and provoke an American response, but the muzzle flashes, the response told the Germans where we were, and then they would open up with machine guns and mortars. Uh, it, it only took a few hours for the Americans to learn, oh, that's what's happening. We're, we're, we're not going to fall for that. In fact, we're going to try and use that to our advantage uh, here in the future. Uh, so the, the learning curve was straight up, uh, but uh, the learning was done uh, very quickly. Nonetheless, uh, you were able to get far enough inland so that the 143rd Infantry, and this is it, landing, came in without too much difficulty uh, and when it, it was able uh, to move up. Uh, late in the afternoon, uh, the German tanks are actually pressing down toward the division's command post and that sort of thing, but one of the half-track mounted 75s uh, got there in time to aid in the artillery, knocking out uh, several German tanks. And as Walker pointed out, uh, as soon as you, even if you missed, you created such a cloud of sand and dust around the tanks that you blinded them. And without infantry there in support, then it became a lot easier to pick off uh, the Mark well, IVs. And, that just came up in the sidebar. That just came up in the sidebar that the, the Germans' tanks don't have enough infantry support and the, the Allies don't have as much naval support, they don't have as much air support, which is why it reduces to, as you say, you know, individuals running up with Tommy guns and putting grenades in tank hatches. It's that it's that sort of battle that the both sides haven't couldn't really bring an integrated combined force to this that they would like to have had. It is it's kind of like how little boys would play a battle with their toys on the on the on the on the bedroom floor. It's that kind of battle. Yeah, it um, is. It is. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah, because neither side has yet got its combined arms teams here. Yeah. The Germans can't do it. The Americans don't have it ashore. Uh, at one point, uh, you've got a hundred and five millimeter howitzer that's come up in a duck, gets unloaded. Uh, and you've got eight German tanks coming at it from a distance of only 300 yards, and it's firing plunk blank at zero elevation, cutting the fuse next to nothing, uh, as though it was a Napoleonic or a Civil War battlefield instead of a World War II uh, battlefield. Uh, and so uh, it's kind of remarkable in, in that way, very not like what you're going to get later uh, in the war. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, comic book style fighting, movie style fighting, as you say, little boy style fighting. Uh, but this is this is the real thing. This is this is the way it was done. And so it put a lot of emphasis on individual valor, small unit leadership, 
you know, uh, and, and the Americans do very well here. Uh, I think it's fair to say the Germans do pretty well here, too. Uh, it's just that we are going to reinforce faster than they can yeah, exactly. uh, on, on those uh, first days. Uh, and so the 36 is ashore. This is kind of a map of its area of operations. You can see over there uh, toward uh, the uh, upper right, uh, upper left, rather, that's the British zone. You can see Pestum there sort of in the lower uh, left. Uh, and then Mount Soprano and the Sile and uh, the Corollary rivers are going to be particularly important in this. They're the dividing line between the British 10th Corps to the left and the 36th Division to the right. The 45th is supposed to land and come and fill that space. But um, as your viewers probably remember from that episode, it's not going to work uh, mm. as, as well uh, as had, had been hoped for. But nonetheless, uh, there is... Um, there is uh, the challenge of the terrain. Uh, and this is a picture from right by the temples of Pestum looking north at Mount Soprano. And as I said, there's nothing like standing on the ground uh, and, and seeing it from the, the GI's point of view. That's very intimidating. Can you imagine having to have dealt with mountains like that at Normandy uh, and how different everything would be? But everywhere you land in Italy, this is basically what you're looking at only 12 or 13 miles inland. And it's only going to get worse. <laughs> it's only going to get worse. And uh, and so you're on a very flat coastal plain. But if the enemy doesn't have enough forces to adequately defend that, you're going to do pretty well. And so by the end of D-Day, the 36th had taken most of its objectives. Uh, it would take the ones that it didn't seize on D-Day very easily the next morning. Uh, and you would still have some trouble on the right flank where a battalion of the 141st was, was pinned down. Uh, but by and large, uh, things go well. And on D plus one uh, on September 10th and again on the 11th, there's a little bit of a lull. Uh, the Germans are kind of regrouping, gathering their strength. We're pouring more troops ashore. But way over on the left flank uh, where the Rangers uh, had gone ashore and the commandos, uh, the Germans have responded very quickly there. You've got a really vicious battle uh, going on. And as a consequence of that, uh, one of the things that happens is uh, one of the battalions uh, of Walker's uh, division uh, is uh, pulled off the line. Uh, and uh, the 1st Battalion, the 143rd, is sent over to reinforce the American Rangers uh, and the commandos. And this is a picture of them fighting alongside the, the British commandos that try and hold Chunsi Pass, which was the critical ground over there. And so that battalion of the division is going to have almost its, it, it is going to have a completely owned fight. Uh, unrelated uh, to the vision is going to be very, very tough, but they're going to manage to, to hold out. Uh, September 11th was an interesting uh, uh, day on the beachhead. Um, so uh, we shot down, the 36 shot down two uh, Spitfires. Uh, everybody was very nervous. There'd been a lot of German uh, uh, air attacks and, and Walker had to scold everybody about that. There was no reoccurrence of it, but one of them managed to, to ditch in the surf there. Uh, and, and the pilot fortunately uh, survived, but that, that's a result of friendly fire. What's not a result of friendly fire is what happens to the USS Savannah off the coast, uh, which was one of the cruisers giving close in support. It was hit by a German uh, Fritz bomb or a, 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 a glide bomb, remote controlled glide bomb, uh, and suffered a lot of casualties and very heavy damage. So there's a lot of damage that's being done to the fleet. Uh, the German air is giving the fleet a lot of problems, even if its attacks on the beachhead are very quick hit and run, unaimed, uh, and they diminish as, as the battle goes forward. The Germans are, are putting most of their air effort uh, to sea uh, mm -hmm. instead of uh, to... But the uh, quick and run German Luftwaffe attacks are, are still something the Allies find difficult to deal with even a year later. I'm hoping to have Russell Hart on at some point talking about that, you know, even in Normandy and later on. They're very difficult the allies to defend against. You don't quite know where they're going to come from. They come at you out the middle of the night. They come in and they, and they bugger off as, as, as soon you know as soon as they come in, and they don't necessarily provide cause much hassle. Yeah, but they're yeah. just an annoyance. They are it, they are an annoyance and potentially a deadly one, and especially yeah. here at Salerno and to a lesser extent, but still significantly at Anzio. Uh, the Germans, of course, are vastly outnumbered in the air. But uh, this is a little bit of a Battle of Britain scenario, is that the Allied planes are coming from a very long way away. 
They can loiter over the beaches or the fleet for 10 or 15 minutes at most, and then they got to go back. Uh, obviously, most of those small fighters are not set up to do nighttime navigation. Yeah, uh, so you have to be you have to pull them away as it gets closer to dusk. And so right at dawn at right at dusk, the German raiders have an enormous opportunity to swoop in from out of the setting sun or out of the rising sun, which is what most of them do. Uh, the uh, the Germans are, are going to pay for this, uh, but they're going to they're going to do a really good job. And you, the other thing I think you need to remember is that uh, you still have a lot of very good veteran German pilots left at this yeah. point in, in Italy. They're not to the point where they have no fuel to train new pilots and that sort of thing. And although most of their air is trying to defend Germany against the strategic bombing offensive, uh, you, you've also got a German air commander in Kesserling who understands this uh, and, and knows that even a weaker force, if it's well handled and attacks at the right time of the day, can do a significant amount of damage. Uh, and then you get everybody jittery and your own anti-aircraft is able to shoot down your own it, planes. It, the, the German Luftwaffe, are call, at this point, I kind of describe them as like the, the light bulb burning brightly before it burns out. They're, they're not very far away now from not having a presence in the ETO at all. It's all going to be pulled back to Germany to defend against increasing numbers of, of Allied bombers coming in. But this is that their last, you know, when we talk about the Battle of the Atlantic and the German happy times, this is kind of the last Luftwaffe happy time in in the med but it's it's not gonna last long but that's us saying that with 2020 hindsight vision 80 years later yeah you, you, you're certainly getting uh, you know at, at that point they're going to do fairly well at anzio uh yeah. but even Two, between Salerno weeks, and yeah. anzio which is what half a year uh, apart a little less actually is that their ability to, to hurt the allies at anzio is is much less even than it was at Salerno. and although yeah. they can still hurt you uh, it's 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 diminished, and so yeah, the the Luftwaffe is is very much uh, on its last legs here. Uh, it's going to fight gallantly to the very end, uh, and but its ability to do real harm is is significantly reduced, and is just going downhill uh, yeah. from from this point forward. Uh, so uh, after the eleventh uh, and the twelfth, the, the fighting for the thirty sixth begins to focus uh, on the village of Alta Vila. Uh, and if you look at that little white clump on that, that span of green, this is the village of Alta Vila uh, from the town of Iboli, uh, which is over by the tobacco factory where the 45th Division yep. had yep. Uh, so much trouble. Uh, but uh, the Americans had grabbed Mount Soprano and the roads around it uh, on the first couple of days of the invasion. So the Germans, if they wanted to be able to to, to have artillery observers who could really call fire in on, on the beachhead, then Alta Vila uh, is, is the place that's going to be uh, really important to them. And once you get up on Alta Vila and the hill that's just beyond it, you're going to get that. So uh, in the, the middle of this picture here, sort of left center, you see that white splotch. That's the town of Alta Vila. And then you'll notice that to your right, that you get a little hump back and then a peak. And that's yep. Hill 424, uh, which sort of dominates Alta Vila. Uh, and so this is going to be uh, on the 13th and 14th of September, the, the one of the real killing grounds uh, for men of the, the 36 and, and where the, the battle, at least on the American sector, is really going uh, to focus. This is a drawing uh, made by uh, an artist with Life magazine of Alta Vila. Uh, and uh, if you go on to Alta Vila and go up to Hill 424 just above it, this is what you see. Uh, and so, you know, right there you see the, 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 the Mediterranean, uh, technically the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, and the beaches and how flat all that ground is. And even today, this is a lot of farmland. It's a lot of open space, and so you could see almost anything uh, that moved around uh, from there. And so with high-powered glasses and field phones and radios, you, know, you could bring a lot of grief down uh, onto the Allied bridgehead uh, as uh, life's artist imagined it, at any rate, in, in a 1943 uh, issue. And so that high ground was something that Walker knew from the very beginning. Uh, he was going to have to capture if the continued unloading on the beaches was not to be disruptive. The men's supplies were going to continue uh, to pour ashore. Uh, and so on uh, the uh, 11th, he sends a battalion 
uh, the uh, 1st Battalion of the 142nd Infantry goes up uh, to Alta Vila uh, and uh, is supposed to defend the town and to grab Hill 424. And these are some pictures from 424. And you can see there you're looking out toward the beaches, but this terrain is simply awful. Uh, it's not a hill in the sense that you would think of, you know, you climb up to, to there's all kinds of gullies. Uh, it's very steep. You've got the uh, olive uh, groves, olive orchards there. Uh, and you can see here, you know, that's a very sharp steep that goes down to a gully that goes up to another hill. So you could not form a solid line of defense. The, the battalion had to sort of scatter its companies around and try and keep them connected with patrols. And that's just going to give the German infantry, which was very good, uh, uh, the way to infiltrate around uh, yeah. the battalion and get on its flanks and to some extent get into its rear so that on uh, the 13th of September, uh, the Germans counterattacked uh, and, and, uh, and uh, they managed to uh, expel the 142nd uh, from the hill and from Alta Vila uh, in extremely uh, tough fighting. And then on the 13th of September, the Germans launched a bigger counterattack uh, that wrecked a couple battalions of the 45th. Uh, and then uh, they had moved a battalion of the, the 36th uh, into the sector between the Sile uh, and River and the Calore up there around Persano. Uh, and that battalion thought it would have the 45th on its left securing its left, and it would be able to tie into the 142nd, the, the 3rd Battalion of the 142nd, 3rd Battalion of the 143rd, which were counterattacking Alta Vila to try and take them back. Uh, but they were so caught up in that battle, and the 45th had not been able to move up, that the Germans were able to launch an armored counterattack that swept around the flanks of that battalion, that hit it from the front, both ends and the rear at the same time, and almost all but obliterated. Uh, very few of those guys uh, managed to get back. Uh, and so uh, this was the September 13th was a really black day for the 36th and the entire Allied bridgehead. Certainly the 45th and the 36th had taken a real blow. Uh, this is when Mark Clark starts to get antsy about, you know, are the Germans going to split the beachhead? Uh, are we going to have to pull back? Am I going to have to ship the 36th and the 45th over to the British beaches? Uh, he orders that draft plans for reembarkation get made. Uh, Walker knows nothing about this at the time. When he hears about it later, he's just aghast because Walker is not panicked here. Uh, he's brought up his anti-tank guns, his artillery, his tank destroyers, his tanks. He hasn't done what the Germans have done and throw them into terrain that's not really suited to them. Uh, he's keeping them undercover uh, in a defensive line, using his infantry and artillery mostly to go on to uh, the offensive. Uh, and although the Americans don't manage to uh, get Al Alta Vila uh, or, and they don't manage to keep it, they're driven off of it, uh, it's a pretty remarkable thing that happens there. So as the uh, Americans are retreating through these narrow little streets of Alta Vila, which is today, of course, very beautiful at the time of World War II, it's going to be blown to smithereens, uh, you have a very difficult situation. The Germans have infiltrated, they're all around you. Uh, and at this point, uh, you have uh, the, the great episode where a sergeant uh, at the time, Corporal Charles E. Ellie, Kelly of Company L-143, earns the Medal of Honor uh, at Alta Vila. Uh, the 36th will actually uh, earn four Medals of Honor uh, at, at Salerno, one on, on the 9th and three on, on the 13th. And Kelly, who you see here, uh, was uh, part of a rear guard that was protecting the withdrawal of his company. Uh, he fired his BAR until it overheated and couldn't be fired anymore. He grabbed another one and fired that until it overheated. He was one of three guys that were left to be the rear guard, and then he told the other two to go on, and he stayed there using just about every weapon in the American arsenal. Uh, he fired a bazooka, uh, knocked out a German armored car, and then as a last ditch, he was taking 60 millimeter mortar rounds, pulling the safety pins out of them, striking them on the bottom to ignite their fuses and dropping them from this uh, 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 balcony onto the Germans in the street. Uh, and and it's, it's he, an insane story. It's, it's, oh, it's one, an insane story. He manages to book, survive. It opens up on that story. That's my favorite one. It kind of, my book just flops open that one because I've read it so many times. 
One of the interesting things is that the army didn't buy it at first, and they actually had to do tests to see if you could use 60 millimeter mortar shells like that before they would go ahead and give him uh, his medal of honor. Uh, but of course it was real. Uh, and that's the kind of individual valor uh, that's shown, but really the fighting on 424 and all, around Alta Vila, that's a slaughterhouse for the, uh, the 36. Uh, the, you know, several battalions are shot to pieces, companies are overrun, the German infiltration tactics were simply excellent. Uh, yeah. And at the end of the day, you're holding an eight mile long front with one division and you don't have the strength to go to a place like Alta Vila and 424 and, and hold it the way that you would need to hold it yeah. against an experienced enemy uh, like that. And just of course, the real remind crisis, ourselves how many different types of combat the 36th have done in effectively a lot less than a week. They've done amphibious landings, moving across open ground. They've attacked hills, with, uh, defended hills, withdrawn from hills, night attacks, dealt with armor, dealt with airstrikes, air. dealt with... I mean, we talked about the fact they're green. They're not green now, are they? I mean, not green really now. Taken, you know, barely, barely three or four days and, and they're a veteran, a veteran unit in terms of just the, the, the a number of different types of scenario they've already faced. And the interesting thing, of course, is there, there's very little in the way of panic. Uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, obviously it's, it's war. Individual men break, individual men don't, don't yeah. that hold up to it and that kind of thing. But, but, but by and large, you know, from the privates all the way through the battalion and regimental commanders and all the way up to General Walker, it's acquitting itself exceptionally well in very difficult circumstances. And uh, the the fighting around Alta Vila was kind of sticking your neck out, trying to grab vital terrain uh, with inadequate force, uh, while the Germans, of course, were getting stronger and massing. And then the battalion that goes over by Persano and gets, you know, cut off, uh, uh, Walker had taken uh, the word of his superiors that the 45th would be there and he would have support. And he castigates himself afterwards for, you know, just accepting the word instead of going to check on it himself. Right. Uh, so even the division commander here is saying, hey, this is a lesson uh, that I've learned. Uh, but where he really shines and the division really shines is when the Germans make their big counterattack on the 14th. And this is the, the commander of the German 10th Army, Weidinghoff, uh, was slow to realize that there was such a big gap between the American and the British invasion forces. And when he finally clues into it, he misinterprets it as that they purposely have done that because they're about to evacuate. That this is this division is so that they can retreat back to the sea. So he launches a massive counterattack down the corridor of the Sile River. Uh, which interestingly, when George Patton looked at Clark's plan, uh, he pointed out, he said, he pointed that said, if I was the German commander, I would counterattack right down this, this gap. Uh, and that's exactly what Weidinghoff did. Uh, most of that falls against the 45th. Uh, but um, the Sealy River uh, was quite an obstacle. It, it's not terribly wide, but you can see here, it's fairly, fairly deep. Uh, it's got a lot of sandbanks that the, 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 uh, the, the uh, banks are fairly and this uh, fairly steep and this bridge here over it this was blown uh, so that the German tanks couldn't cross and in fact if you look on the right side there you can see there's a little patch that's a different color underneath and that's the repair done mm. uh, in the 1940s here uh, to fix that bridge so the Germans had a hard time getting across the river uh, they they gained some success but then they had to veer around and try and cross La Posa Creek which was defended by the 36 and Walker had deployed his anti-tank guns and his tanks and everything so expertly that the Germans were just stopped cold. Uh, there was a bit of a crisis on the, on the 13th and you were throwing every man you had into the front lines because the front had become so extended. You had to pull the units back from Alta Vila and put them into the, into the line. Uh, they dropped uh, paratroopers into uh, the, the bridgehead from the 82nd, uh, a regiment from the 82nd to reinforce uh, the, the American forces. Uh, but there was really never quite any danger after the 13th. The, the big counterattacks, the 14th, but uh, especially on the 36th Division front, things are well in hand. But there's a great phrase on the 13th where Walker is even deploying the band of the division uh, as combat infantrymen. He's supposed to have said, drop the bassoon and grab a bazooka. Uh, and, and put those guys into line. But even these rear echelon troops, sort of a la Battle of the Bulge, uh, 
uh, you know, handle this this uh, this circumstance very well. And, and the line holds without much difficulty. Uh, and the German armor uh, is uh, turned back from the river, uh, and it, it's basically suffers enormous uh, losses. And these are a couple of, of the Mark IV specials uh, that are knocked out uh, during the fighting there. Uh, and once this counterattack fails, uh, the Germans really don't have any other alternatives. The Eighth Army is coming up from the south. Now it's just a very short distance away. Uh, and so Kesseling has to give the order to retreat uh, to the Volturno River, where he's going to make his initial stand before building his defensive lines at Ningado Gap and Casino that are going to give the Allies uh, such a fit. So the, the fight had been touch and go on occasion. Uh, it had certainly been tough. It had been, as I said, a steep learning curve for Green Division, but that division had acquitted itself uh, very well with the beachhead secured, the supplies and the men and the material could roll ashore. The drive toward Naples uh, could uh, could begin. Uh, Naples would fall within a very short period of time. Uh, but it had all, of course, come uh, at a cost. And for the 36th Division, that cost was 279 dead, 681 wounded, 970 missing, almost all of them prisoners from the initial uh, set back uh, on 424 in Alta Vila, and then the battalion that was lost between the Sile and the Corle. Uh, the division, although it had gotten large influxes of draftees, uh, initially from New England uh, in 1941, which was a uh, cause a little bit of a problem because you're only 80 years away from the American Civil War at that point. Uh, there's still some Civil War veterans that were alive, and so you brought in these New England Yankees and tossed them in with a bunch of rebel Texans uh, there were there were fisticuffs for a while uh, until things got <laughs> sorted out. And then uh, there were more draftees that came in from Kentucky and Tennessee. But this was still largely a Texas division, certainly in its in its officer ranks, certainly in its high command of the Walker himself uh, is an Ohioan. Uh, he buys into this whole uh, Texas uh, spree de corps, sees merit in it, intends to keep it, to build it up. He's got a Texas flag given into him by the governor that he has at his head headquarters tent. Uh, so uh, throughout the war, the 36 is known as the Texas Army. Uh, yeah. and, and even as it has fewer and fewer Texans, it, it keeps that identity. When you went into Salerno, probably somewhere around 60, 65 percent of the division are still Texans. Uh, and that is represented in the losses. Texas as a state suffered more casualties in the division at Salerno than any other state. Uh, 101 dead, 290 wounded. 364 missing, 755 Texans were casualties at Salerno. Uh, next to that, Pennsylvania suffered 134, New York 171, New Jersey 133, Ohio 111, and Illinois 112. So, you know, a seventh of the casualties that Texas suffers uh, at, at Salerno. And, and there will be fewer and fewer Texans in the division, of course, as the war goes on, although that Texas identity uh, would never leave. Of course, the battlefields are still very much remembered. As I uh, mentioned, I just came back from the 80th anniversary celebrations there. The people of Salerno and Pestum, uh, you know, commemorate these dates uh, every year. That's the 36th Division Monument at Pestum. It's about 100 yards away from that 16th century tower uh, that survived the battle that mounted a German machine gun. Uh, by the way, our monuments are made out of the same pink granite uh, as our state capitol building. And so whether it's a World War II monument or a World War I monument or a Civil War monument, all Texas uh, monuments to its troops are the same way. The story of Salerno, of course, uh, doesn't end. The division goes on to fight through Italy. It's the, it leads the breakout from the Anzio beachhead. It's the first allied division to pass through Rome. It helps spearhead the invasion of Southern France, breaches the Vosges Mountains, cracks the Siegfried Line. Uh, all this sort of thing. Uh, but there is one particularly poignant story uh, about all of the, the Salerno fighting uh, that, that's really compelling. And that story is about one of the Medal of Honor recipients, Private uh, William Crawford, Company I, the 142nd. Uh, so on September 13th, 1943, during the fighting around Alta Vila, uh, he exhibits remarkable courage and perseverance, knocking out a series of German machine gun nests. I mean, real... Uh, you know, 
heroic kind of stuff. Uh, but in the later fighting, he's captured. Uh, and uh, it's not known these captured. There were a lot of guys who were killed up in those mountains. Near and so it was resumed that he was killed. Uh, his action earned him a Medal of Honor with the assumption that he had died in the battle. Uh, his, uh, his medal was presented to his father by President Roosevelt uh, in 1944. And then lo and behold, in 1945, it's discovered that Crawford had been captured. Uh, he hadn't been killed. Uh, and so he was a prisoner of war, so he's repatriated. He stays in the Army, rises eventually to the rank of Master Sergeant, and then he retires from the Army uh, in the 1960s. And a few years after that, he takes a job as the janitor, one of the janitors at the United States Air Force Academy in Boulder, <laughs> Colorado. And uh, none of the cadets, of course, knew anything about him. They, they knew who he was, but they didn't really pay attention to him. He's a janitor, right? He's, he's kind of one of those people who fades into the background, despite the important work that they do. Uh, and then uh, one day, one of the cadets was reading about the battle for Salerno, and he saw a reference to a William Crawford earning the Medal of Honor. And he thought, oh, it couldn't be. But he went and asked the janitor, are you that William Crawford? And the janitor says, yeah, that's me. Uh, and they're like, well, why did you ever say anything? And he says, well, that was just one day in my life, you know, and, and it was a day a very long time ago. Well, of course, the word gets around very quickly. Suddenly, the janitor is Mr. Crawford, uh, greeted by every cadet, every teacher, every officer who sees him. And in talking to him, they find out that his one disappointment uh, was that he did not receive his Medal of Honor in person from the president. And so the uh, Air Force Academy arranged to have Ronald Reagan come out and present the Medal of Honor to William Crawford. Uh, this is a picture of him uh, getting that medal. Uh, they made a big deal out of it. Uh, and when Crawford dies in 2000, he becomes the only non-Air Force personnel to be buried at the Air Force Academy. Uh, and, and of course, it was done with, with full honors. And so uh, these battles of 80 years ago uh, resonate to, to this day, not only in what they did for the geostrategic course of history, uh, not only for what they did to individual lives and the lives of families and the careers of soldiers and stuff like that. They still have the ability uh, to, uh, to inspire us uh, and, and to... Uh, Give us examples that we would all do well to to emulate. Well, absolutely, Jeff, and what a what a fantastic story to finish with, um, because you know it's been a sweeping one about uh, regiments and, and and objectives, but to finish with a personal story like that is is fantastic. And we have a question from Peter O'Connell because one of the things that's come up in this series is. You know, we talked about the morale of the Canadian division because they're not completely in in the most severe combat yet they are in the line and, and the Italy campaign is a long arduous only gets worse campaign and you know Peter O'Connell is saying I get the impression that as the war progressed the 36th infantry division were not happy in their work when did this develop then or later on so is this is there a morale issue that kind of creeps in and, and what would you put it down to yeah, morale's pretty good after Salerno. I mean, they, they've met combat. They've beaten the enemy. Uh, Walker's talking about, hey, we have nothing to fear from German tanks. We've proven that we can deal with them and that sort of stuff. But once you, you get them up uh, to uh, San Pietro, uh, which, of course, is the subject of uh, John Houston's great documentary, The Battle of San Pietro, which actually uh, captures some of that fighting there. Uh, and, and they get into the, the winter grind in Italy, like everybody else, uh, you know, the, the physical misery. Uh, and, and even for what Walker believed was just the, the, the strategic and tactical foolishness of, you know, frontal attacks on strongly defended mountain strongholds. And that once you gain them, uh, then there's another one. And it, uh, during, during the fighting, uh, the medics of the 36, you know, they were supposed to write on the tag where somebody was wounded, not physically on their body, but, you know, the location yeah, yeah, yeah. of their wound. And they just took to riding a uh, hillside uh, dominated by another hill because that's what it was like. Uh, the, the 36, you know, uh, takes uh, San Pietro, uh, Mount Longo, uh, Mount Samucro. That's where Ernie Pyle writes the famous column that wins in the Pulitzer Prize on the death of Co Captain Waskow. Uh, it was a member of the 36th Division, and it's an incredibly moving story. Uh, it, but it's the repeat of. 
it's yeah. the Rapido that really, really does it. Um, and by that point, of course, the, the number of infantrymen that you have left here were at Salerno and even at San Pietro is, is not great. Uh, it's massive amounts of reinforcements who have all that learning to do, who are put into a particularly bad situation. Uh, Mark Clark, uh, of course, was gambling that the Germans were on the verge of cracking and that you could breach the Rapido and the 1st Army Division could go barreling up to meet the, the Anzio troops that were going to land uh, at, at the same time. And of course, that was all wrong. The, the Germans weren't on the verge of cracking. They were well dug in and and had all the high ground, and yet you ask the, the 141st and 143rd to cross a mile of muddy mined ground, lugging assault boats and footbridges, and then try to go down uh, into a very fast flowing river with very steep banks that was very deep and very cold, uh, and bridge them under mortar machine gun and artillery fire, and then you know cross another mile of open ground, laced with barbed wire, mines, interlocking machine gun nest and that sort of stuff. And, and basically two regiments got wrecked uh, yeah. in doing that. And there would have been a third if if Walker had, had not resisted throwing his reserve uh, into that. Uh, and uh, for the men who survived that, there was an enormous amount of bitterness. That, that it was one thing to ask them to do the difficult. It was another thing to ask them to do the impossible. Yeah. Uh, and and Walker believed it was impossible. You remember me mentioning he was at the Mar and his battalion helped repulse 10,000 Germans. And he saw the Rapido as the Mar and just with roles reversed. Uh, of course, Clark and uh, his uh, his uh, Corps commander, Keyes, sort of blamed Walker. You know, he wasn't enthusiastic enough. And if you weren't enthusiastic, so it was sort of a long street at Gettysburg kind of a, a thing. <laughs> Uh, Walker actually did everything that he could do. He suggested crossing the river upstream where it was fordable. If you're really going to try and get across the river, let's do it there. But of course, Clark had his, his reasons. Uh, but after that battle, uh, the survivors actually decided that when they got home, they would demand a, a investigation into Clark for the Rapido. And so right after they get home, they formed the 36th Infantry Association and they do get an investigation. Uh, they get the Congress and Senate to demand one from the War Department. And, of course, the War Department looks at it and says, no, Walker, uh, or rather Clark, uh, Clark had his reasons. His reasons were fine. He, he did not make a misjudgment or something like that. But the 36 never forgave him. Uh, they hated him to the end of their days. They hated him so much that uh, before the Division Association finally passed uh, from the scene, uh, uh, they were going to have a reunion. The last reunion they had was about seven years ago. Only had eight veterans. Only six of them were World War II. Mm. And Mark Clark's daughter wanted to come, and they would not let her. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that tells you something. That, yeah. that, that, that tells you, you something. And, uh, you know, so was there's no question Rapido was a mistake and having three days to plan it, you know, everything about it was wrong, except, as a British officer said, except the courage. Uh, and, uh, you know, Clark's obsession with Rome, yes, it was there, but did he feel like his army deserved to get that prize and the recognition, uh, for all this hard fighting? Yes, absolutely. Did he want that for his own personal career, uh, and vainglory? I don't think there's a question about that, uh, either. At the same time, I, I think you can look at every single general in history, no matter how great they were. And you can find the one day or the one battle or the one operation where they they operated on what they hoped was true or what they thought they were true or they were over optimistic. And so, you know, Nimitz has Tarawa, Lee has Pickett's yep. Charge, Grant has Cold Harbor, uh, and, you know, and these sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, war is not a clean business and it's it's very easy from hindsight to look back. Uh, and call strikes and balls. Uh, it's it's a lot harder to do at the time. But even then, I think that that the Rapido River operation was was really one that everybody should have known better. And then that was really, yeah. you know, operating on wishful thinking instead of tactical reality, and and not necessarily chateau generalship. I mean, they'd been up to the front; they knew what the conditions were. Uh, but they were so desperate to end this bloody Italian stalemate that they were willing to throw the dice. And, yeah. and that's what generals do. They, they roll dice with men's lives. But for the men whose lives are lost and changed, well, that's a very different perspective. 
And that was true as at Salerno, just like it was true at Rapido. They recovered from it. Uh, the division was pulled back, reinforced, uh, retrained. Went into Anzio, leads the breakout, you know, helps capture Rome, and then its morale goes sky high again. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Rapido sort of its nadir, uh, and there's a lot of war in front of it and a lot of hard war in front of it, but it's never going to get to that low a spirit again. Well, thank you for that. And you know what you've done? You've talked yourself into being invited back to do a Rapido River show uh, at the, the next time that come the Italy series comes to World War II TV. If you'd like to, that would be fantastic. I, I, I'd be happy to. My interesting side story is I have done the Rapido River Crossing in a sort of way. The BBC did a series called Battlefields presented by Richard Holmes about 25 years ago with reenactor footage. And I was in the Rapido River Crossing scene. We filmed it in Snowdonia in Wales. We had an assault boat that was one of the leftovers from a bridge too far that hadn't been used since the oh. bridge too far. And we had to kind of put it together ourselves while we're being filmed. And about 10 of us jumped in. I was carrying a BAR. Yeah, and uh, there was a diving team there because we're doing it at night. Uh, it's just an extra story for you folks. And uh, we're all loaded up, you know, no no real ammunition or anything. But, you know, I had the BAR belt, blah, blah, blah. And, and the diver guy said that if the boat goes down, because there was a chance the boat would sink because it hadn't been used for whatever it was, 30 years, uh, try and float, he said to us all. There's one diver and there's 10 of us. And I said... When I, if that boat sinks and I go, because I'm carrying a beer, I'm going to be going down like a stone. Look for me on the bottom. Uh, in the <laughs> end, you're not letting go of that I'm, BAR. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I didn't have the, the, the sling around my neck. I had it in a position where I could just ditch it. But it, it was my BAR. I, I, it cost a lot of money. I didn't really want to lose it in a, in a Welsh river. But if anyone that has that series on VHS or DVD, I am one of the 36 guys in that boat for that crossing. But anyway, that's a little random story for my reenactment days. Yeah, well, I've done a lot of reenactments and we've, we've landed in landing craft, LCVPs and, and L LCMs and ducks and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I've even gone down the rope nets uh, off the side of a, a Liberty ship uh, down into a landing wow. craft and in nice calm waters. <laughs> uh, and it's, um, it's intimidating and it and even as a reenactment it's it's dangerous uh without yeah. people shooting at you and that sort of thing and you can understand how daunting a thing that was in in real war and that's one of the things that reenacting does for you it gets you as close as you can uh and you realize just how not only difficult these things were how easy it is to really get killed yeah. uh, and to imagine what would happen if your buddies around you or some of your best friends were the ones that were getting killed and maimed. And even worse, if you were the one who was giving the orders that would lead to them getting killed and maimed. And so if you, you stop and you think about it, uh, it's a very sobering thing to, to, to reenact and a very sobering thing to stand on a real battlefield. Well, we will leave it there, Jeff. I will extend an invitation to come back and carry on the 36th uh, Division story at some time in the future. Folks, I'm back again twice tomorrow. We've got one show at 12 p.m. Liz Coward is talking about the Royal Army Medical Corps of the San Salerno at one in the evening, while Alexander Clark is talking about the Royal Navy and destroyers and all that kind of stuff. And you'll know how good Alexander Clark is from his own YouTube channel. But right now, I'm going to extend my thank you to Jeff Hunt and my thank you to everybody for your fantastic comments in the sidebar. And I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye.